Should have gotten some Halloween earrings from Hobby Lobby while I was at it. Hi everyone, I'm Liz and welcome back to Elizabeth Ann Can Stitch for Floss Tube episode 17. Hello, hello, hello. How was everybody's week? Uh, welcome back. I had a little bit of a crazy work week and didn't get quite as much stitching as I wanted done, but I still got a lot of things done and I have so much to share with you guys this week. I got a lot of really great questions on my last video where I featured three finishing videos and um, I put the question out to you guys on Instagram and YouTube to uh, ask if you had any other questions about finishing or cross stitching in general. And I got a lot of really good questions. So I'm gonna start the episode today by going through a little bit of a Q and A. Okay, so here's where I put my disclaimer in that um, I'm not a professional. <laughs> I don't finish cross stitch for a living. I don't frame cross stitch for a living. This is just for me, for fun, for my family. Um, yeah, so these are techniques that I use, like I use my quilting tools, I use my sewing tools, my skills from sewing. Like I just use like scrapbook skills, you know, anything I know how to do to finish an ornament. And I've watched a lot of Vonna Pfeiffer uh, videos. And if you're really serious about finishing your stuff at home, highly recommend the Vonna Pfeiffer uh, finishing school videos. Uh, she doesn't speed anything up, they're really, in depth. Um, so I really recommend those. Um, yeah, so that's my disclaimer. I'm just going to tell you what I do and what works for me, but I'm sure there are better ways or other ways or, you know, so I'm just going to tell you what I do. <laughs> okay. So the first question comes from Sarah on, um, Instagram and she's asking how to make your white stitches look nicer. And I classify this as a question as one I can't really answer. I don't know. I don't feel like my white stitches look very good. Um, I brought an example. I'll really like show you what I mean. Um, that's what my white stitches look like two over two on 32. Not great, Bob. Uh, I mean, they're fine. I'm not like, it's nothing I would pick out. Just, I don't feel like I have great stitches with white. So I'm not really sure what to tell you other than one, my stitches with one strand. On, uh, of white look better than two. So for me, that means I usually stitch on 36. I mean, all of my stitches look better with one strand. Um, so that's my preferred way to stitch, but I do still stitch on 28 and 32, um, you know, so I do have time to practice my two over two with white, but um, yeah, I don't know. I just let it be what it is. Uh, I have like unthreaded and rethreaded my needle to like, you know, um, untwist the threads and make sure they're still laying properly. Um, but other than that, I don't know. I don't have a lot of tips for stitching with white other than I try to do all of my white stitching first so that I'm not pulling um, accidentally other threads through the white. I think that's a common thing that a lot of people do. So if I have like, for instance, this part of the white roof, um, I stitched that before I did um, you know, the red surrounding it. Yeah, I don't know. So this is where I'm going to say if anybody in the comments has tips, um, and feels like they have good answers to some of these questions, please leave them below. And let's use the comment section as like a Wikipedia <laughs> for cross stitching tips. Um, okay. So next up, I had another question that I felt like, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer. And this is from Kathy on YouTube. And she asked me to talk about ironing and washing your cross stitch piece when you're finished. Um, so I'm gonna tell you what I do. I've never washed a cross stitch piece. I don't know, I, that terrifies me. <laughs> I also don't, I mean, I know I stitch in hand, but I also don't feel like my cross stitches, my pieces get dirty. I've never washed one. So I know a lot of people do. Um, I know a lot of people don't. I, I don't know the answer to this one. Uh, as far as ironing goes, I do iron all my pieces. I hate, you know, um, I stitch in hand, so I wrinkle up the linen, you know, or get folds in it. Um, so yes, I iron. I use a big white fluffy towel that I got at Target. It's like the Thresh Field Crest. That's a brand, like kind of fancier brand at Target. So I got a big white fluffy towel that I double over and lay on my ironing board. And um, then I lay my cross stitch piece down. I do use steam. 
not a ton, but I use steam on persistent wrinkles. Uh, never had a problem with color bleeding. I check every time to make sure. And I have been known to use some best press spray if I really have a, you know, like a fold that just won't come out. And so far so good. I've never heard a cross stitch piece. Um, your mileage may vary. Uh, but yeah, that's what I do. I, I definitely iron um, a good firm ironing with a little bit of steam. And occasionally I'll use a little bit of best press if I really have a wrinkle I can't get out. Okay, and then Leona from YouTube asked about attaching a piece of cross stitch to wood um, and then also possibly attaching with magnets to um, switch pieces out. So I will say that I think I've only used magnets on one piece and it didn't go well. So I'm not an expert on that. I know Priscilla and Chelsea do that with a lot of their stuff. Um, I don't think I found the right magnets and washer combination. Um, so really, honestly, I just finish things and that's it. I don't switch them out <laughs> or I haven't yet. Um, so I don't have a good answer for you on that. But as far as attaching your cross stitch to a piece of wood or board, like at one of those Lula May or Homestead Needlework boards, um, I do it the same way I do any kind of finishing where I take a piece of mat board with a piece of batting on top, um, wrap my cross stitch to the back and use my tacky glue to glue down the edges. And then I just tacky glue the whole back of the piece um, lightly, not like overdone and spread the glue around. So it's like all over the back of the piece, flip it, lay it down where I want them on the wood and then stack heavy books on top of it to um, get the glue to dry completely flat with the piece. And it works great. Nothing's come apart. Um, tacky glue is my fave. Uh, <laughs> and I got a lot of questions about the glue, so we'll get there. Okay, so Mary from YouTube. Um, sorry, I'm looking at my notes over here. Okay, so she said she's a newbie and she wanted to know where to start on a pattern. The center, the corner, the middle, where, you know, like where... Um, do you start on a pattern, especially one that has a border? And so what I want to say is that I always start in the top right corner, unless it's kind of a weirdly shaped pattern um, and it makes sense to start in another spot, but I am a top right starter. Uh, I think when a lot of people start out, they do like to start in the middle because you can kind of build out and count. You have a good starting place to count from, from the middle, but I feel like you also do on the top right as well. I'm a person who, when I stitch something with borders and samplers, I don't stitch the whole border. I stitch it as I go to make sure it's constantly lined up with other reference points of stitching. Um, so I'm not gonna be off when the border meets up. I know people play that game of chicken with their border. <laughs> and it is cool to see like the border all done and then you fill in everything in the center. But like, I can't, I can't unpick that much. If I, you know, got to the end of that border and I had messed it up, I would just put the piece away. <laughs> Um, so I start in the top and work my way over to the left and I like to do the border as I go. That way I know that the border is lined up with the motifs and then I'm not off anywhere. Or if I do get off, I can identify it really quickly and fix it before I get all the way down the piece. Um, so that's how I start is up in the top right. Okay. Rhonda on YouTube asked if I could show how I store my floss which you can see over my shoulder. So let me grab that and I'll show you. Okay, so I think I did talk about this in an earlier video, but since this is a Q&A video, I'm gonna include it again. So as you can see, I have a pegboard um, attached to the wall and I bought um, just a various sizes of the straight pegs that you sit into the board, probably about four to five inches long in length. And then I take these two inch uh, binder clips these just open up like this. I'm sure you've seen these. You can get a pack of a lot of these on Amazon for cheap. Um, they're just called binder rings. And I store my floss by brand. So here is a uh, ring of Weeks. Here is a ring of Gentle Arts. And here is a ring of Classic Color Works. And I do them by color family. So you can see I picked the kind of red, pink, orange rings to bring out and show you. Oh, look how pretty that is. I just wear these as earrings. <laughs> uh, who needs those Hobby Lobby earrings? I got my floss rings. <laughs> um, so, 
yeah, that's what I do. Uh, I, I have gotten a comment about, do I worry about fading? Uh, this window that's right here to my right, it is under a covered porch. So there's never direct sunlight into the room. And also I mostly keep the blinds semi-closed. So there's never direct sunlight on them, but I guess they could still fade. I really haven't noticed anything. I've only had this system in place for probably about six months. So I don't know. Um, but so far it works for me. I like like when I'm making substitutions, I do it by color, right? So I know a lot of people alphabetize their flosses, but for me, it's easier to say, oh, I need um, licorice red. I know that's on the red ring and I'll go look through the reds and find it. And if I don't have it, I'm like, oh, I don't have licorice red. Let me see, you know, do I have a comparable gentle art or weeks? And I go look through these and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, Aztec red, you know, looks nice or something. Um, so that's how I, that's how I store my flosses. And so I have about three or four rings of each brand at this point. Um, most of these are used, um, oh, I guess, ooh, always dropping things. Um, I guess this licorice red isn't, but a lot of these, you know, are used and have the leftovers up top. Um, Cause when I get done with the project, I put them on these rings so I can use them again. You guys like my ghosty sweater? Got it at Mod Cloth. <laughs> so fun. Okay, so Whitney and Don't Run With Scissors on YouTube asked me about what type of glue I use and why. And let me show you my favorite glue, the only one I really use. Unless I need to like attach a magnet or metal um, and then I might use some like E6000, but I don't even know where that bottle is right now. Most of the time it's just tacky glue. Um, Aileen's Tacky Glue dry. Does it say quick dry? No, just original tacky glue. I think they have a quick dry formula. I just use the original in the gold bottle. You can get these at Michael's, Hobby Lobby, Joann's, Amazon, any craft store. We'll have Aileen's. Um, why I use it. One, because of Vanna. I watched all of Vanna's videos a few years ago. <laughs> she was using tacky glue. I use tacky glue. Uh, I do have a hot glue gun and I have used it um, for some finishing, but I don't, I don't like it anymore. And I'll tell you why I prefer the tacky glue. Um, one, it's a hot, it's not going to burn my fingers. Two, it has a pretty long dry time. Like it sets down and gets tacky immediately to hold stuff, but it's not going to completely dry for about like 15 to 20 minutes. So you have a lot of play time to adjust. You know, um, you might notice in my finishing videos, I'm pretty cavalier about centering my um, my, mount, my mounting board and then starting to fold over my edges without a lot of measuring. And it's because I can adjust um, and slide things around after I glue to get everything centered exactly where I want it. Um, that's what I love about the tacky glue. Uh, it's also super strong and holds really well. It dries completely clear. So on projects like this, um, I run, you know, I mount this cross stitch to the backing board and then I run a bead of glue down the edges and put the trim on. And even if some squeezes out, it dries completely clear. You can't see any glue. I feel like with hot glue, it dries a little thick and puffy, right? Um, it's not completely flat. So I feel like it's harder to hide if you make a mistake with hot glue. Also, it dries instantly. And I know you can peel it off of things, but um, I just find tacky glue a lot easier to work with. It isn't an instant hold. I mean, it's tacky instantly, but you do have to give it a little bit of time to set. So I guess hot glue would probably speed up your process, but I prefer the tacky glue. Owl and Gator Stitches wanted to know um, what type of batting I use. And I've gotten this question a lot too um, on various videos. I like to use 100% cotton batting in my quilts. And so that's what I use in my projects because that's what I have scraps of laying around. Most of the time it's that warm and natural or white and natural brand that you can get at Joann's or Hobby Lobby. Um, sometimes it's just whatever 100% cotton brand my uh, long arm quilt shop carries that I buy from them. But yeah, it's always just like a, a very thin 100% cotton um, batting. Okay, let's talk about pins. Uh, Stitching by the Moon on Instagram and Tina and Bonnie on YouTube all asked about 
the pins I use. And of course, I don't have the packaging except for the little container. Um, but what I use, let me grab one. They are called sequin pins. And they are very small. Um, you can see the little flat, tiny flat head on them. Uh, and they are about, yeah. Well, I said three quarters of an inch in one of my comments to somebody, but they really are closer to half an inch. Oh, there we go. They are very small. Um, but yeah, they're called sequin pins. I got them at Hobby Lobby or Michael's. I don't remember now where. Uh, you can get them wherever. They're easy to find. Um, I might look into doing like a stainless steel for, I guess, less potential for rusting, but I'm not that concerned about it. Um... None of my pieces are in a bathroom or kitchen setting. Uh, it's not super humid here. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I've never really been that concerned with the pins. Uh, so I just grabbed sequin pins in this little short size. Um, the reason I like the short size is because it's easier to push in straight without the pin veering off to the side and poking out through the foam board or poking out through the front of the piece. So if you're trying to pin with those, you know, inch and a half long straight pins, Whew, you're gonna have to be a lot more careful. It'll be a lot more slow. Um, and it'll be frustrating if you think you're done and then you notice pins sticking out through the front of your piece. <laughs> okay, over on YouTube, Bailey asked me what kind of line I use when I'm pinning. And what I do is take my quilting ruler and lay it down on my piece and find the margin I want. So, um, and then what I do to mark it is I use this air erasing air erasing sew line marker. It's just like a little felt tip marker. Um, the line erases pretty quickly. <laughs> so you gotta work quick, but um, it also erases quickly. So you're not gonna have any marks left on your piece. Uh, yeah, so I mark my edges uh, where I wanna pin and I make sure when I'm marking that I'm doing it on a straight piece of linen thread uh, as, as close as possible, right? Because the whole goal is to try to get your linen threads perpendicular to each other and the edges of your foam board. So um, I use my quilting ruler and this the pin, or pen, not pin, pen, uh, to mark a line on the linen threads where I want it to hit the edges of my foam board to pin. So that's what I do. JSR944 wanted to know, do I lace after I pin? I don't. Um, I just fold the edges over and use this acid-free double-sided sticky tape um, to fold my edges over the back and that's it. Um, the pins are what hold the cross stitch to the mounting board and stretch it. The lacing, you would lace instead of pinning um, or you could lace and then pin. I've seen that method but for me I pin it exactly where I want it and tuck my edges over with some double stick tape and I'm good. Uh, Jacqueline asked where I get my mat board. So I always call it mat board because it is that consistency. But what I'm actually buying from Hobby Lobby, um, because it comes in these big like 32 by 40 sheets, is called Art Board. And it's by Canson, the art brand. I think they are famous for like their watercolor papers. But they make this stuff called Art Board, which is, you know, maybe a 16th of an inch thick. It's, you know, it's it's like mat board thickness. Um, and it's easy for me to cut with my rotary cutter and uh yeah it works really great for my purposes and it's available in these big huge sheets at Hobby Lobby it might be available other places but uh, my closest craft store is Hobby Lobby so that's where I tend to get most of my supplies okay April Airlines on Instagram she asked me how I measure a piece and pick a custom size frame like how do I know what size frame I want um when I finish stitching a piece and get ready to frame it so that's a good question. <laughs> um, basically what I do is I have a big clear uh, quilting ruler. Uh, you've seen it in a lot of my finishing videos. It's the big 12 by 12 clear um, ruler. And so what I do when I finish a piece is I lay it out on my cutting table and I measure uh, from furthest stitch to furthest stitch horizontally and vertically um, and figure out the exact size of my stitched piece. So if I have a stitched piece that ends up say five by seven and 
I then decide how much of a margin do I want? How much fabric do I want around the edge of the piece? And for me, usually that's about, I'm gonna say a half inch that I want showing um, around the, the edges of my finished piece. So if I have a five by seven piece and I know I want a half inch margin on each side, that's already an inch I need to add to the width and height, right? But then you need to take into account, um, actually, let me demo it for you. Okay, so on this piece, um, this actually probably only has a quarter inch margin just because of the frame size that I was working with. But let me show you what I'm talking about. So if you've decided you want a half inch border of fabric, um, you would add an inch to the width and the height of your finished cross stitch piece. So that would be, let's see, five by seven, it would be a six by eight frame, right? But what you need to take into account is that frames have a lip inside that the cross stitch piece fits in. So you have your piece here, but you're not gonna see the edges of the fabric um, about a quarter inch in because it sits inside that lip, right? And so now it's a much tighter margin on all the sides. So uh, after you've added your inch in each direction, you now need to add a half inch extra to account for the quarter inch at the top and the bottom and the side to the side of the frame. So for a five by seven piece, we've added one inch for margin for, uh, for our fabric margin. And so that's gonna be six by eight. And then we need to add a half inch in each direction to account for the frame lip. And so then that's gonna be a six and a half by eight and a half inch frame that I would end up ordering to mount my finished five by seven cross stitch piece. I hope that helps. Um, I'm sure there's tools out there online to help you. Um, I'm sure I'm going to Google and see if I can find like a framing calculator. But that's that's how I do it. I decide how much, you know, margin I want a piece to have. Like on my Barbara Anna piece, I wanted a little bit more of the background fabric to show because I wanted the framed piece to be a little bit bigger than the stitched piece in general. So I think I gave a full inch margin, like a showing inch margin. So that means an inch and a quarter to account for the lip of the frame right on each side um and so i sized that piece up a little bit bigger for the frame um i hope that helps okay um let's see who asked this question siobhan i think that's how you say your name i have irish coworkers. i should probably know how to say this name i think it's siobhan anyways she asked me where i get all of my trims for finishing all <laughs> You like this pile of chenille? I'm very organized in this craft room. I'm not. I mean, the threads are, but this is what sits in a big basket <laughs> for me to play with. Um, okay, so the answer is Lady.Creates. I get 90% of my trim um, from Lady.Creates. I love the chenille, love the pom-poms. I have gotten some of the ribbons, but I haven't used them yet, but I want to. Um, but yeah, lady.creates on Etsy. Okay. And then Bailey asked me how, um, I consider or what I consider when I'm choosing glass or no glass on a piece. And, hmm, really it's about who's framing it, me or, um, like a custom frame shop. So if I'm going to a frame shop, I'm getting the museum glass. I like the idea of having the glass and having the piece completely sealed but I only like it if it is the fancy, completely see-through, non-reflective museum glass. I hate the store-bought frame glass that comes in those store-bought frames from Hobby Lobby or Michaels. It's so shiny and reflective. It's harder to see the piece once you framed it, you've done all this beautiful work, and then you have this shiny reflective piece of glass on top of it that is impeding your ability to see your beautiful stitch piece. So if I buy a frame at a store, I'm not using that glass. I have thought about maybe seeing if I can get Hobby Lobby or Michaels to cut me a piece of the nice museum glass to replace the store-bought frame. I haven't done that yet though. So my pieces with store-bought frames, they're just not, there's no glass. It's, you know, I can see my work beautifully. 
I don't find that I get that big of a dust problem or anything. Um, I will like feather dust, you know, over my cross stitch pieces. Um, I have these behind me that are from 1983. Uh, they're from a Goodwill, a thrift shop, and they don't have glass on them. They're still in perfect condition. I don't think you have to have glass. I know it's recommended. Um, but I only do it if I can get good quality glass. And usually that means I'm going to a frame shop to actually have them frame for me. I did frame at home with glass for the first time recently. I showed you guys that in last week's video. And that glass is like a higher quality, anti-reflective UV coated glass, but it's not as good as museum glass. I think I was showing it to you guys, right? It's pretty reflective, but mostly just because of that big light. Where I have it hung, there's no big light on it and it looks great. So um, I'm going with that. <laughs> But I do want to only use glass if it is the fancy museum glass. Oh, so annoying because it's so much more expensive. But I don't know. That's what I think about when I'm using glass or not. Shelby and Yvonne on YouTube asked me, how do I use spacers when I frame with glass? Um, so that's what I did for the first time last week on my All Hallows Eve, um, A Wicked Plant framed piece. And I learned about this from kitten stitchers framing videos she did a couple of them and it is just a piece of clear acrylic with adhesive a peel off adhesive on one side and this is just what the spacer looks like it comes in sticks it's about three feet um I bought a five foot stick from Michaels I don't think this is something they typically sell I had to ask the framing department to sell me a piece and they made up a price and they were willing to do it. I don't know if all Michaels would be willing to do it. Um, you can find it online, so I'll link it. But yeah, um, this is what an acrylic spacer looks like. I just used my needle nose pliers that have the little wire snip in them. If you're familiar with like, you know, a little wire snip, I use that to <laughs> to break slash trim the spacer. I'm sure there's a better tool for this, but it's just plastic. You know, you just break it. You don't have to, these pieces don't have to be exact. The whole purpose is just to set your cross stitch piece or set the glass up off your cross stitch piece. So what you do with this, let me grab this framed piece again as an example. Although it doesn't have spacers, I can show you what I do. Okay, so in the back of your piece, what you would do is you would put your glass, you would lay this flat on the table and you would put your glass in and then you would, you know, measure, okay, I need a piece about this long, make it a little bit shorter because you don't want it to go edge to edge because that's too much measuring. Um, and you would break off this piece of spacer and then you would peel off this backing and you would press that right into the glass, the very edge, as close as you can get to the edge of the frame so that it doesn't show. I mean, it is clear, but you just wanna make sure it's tucked inside the lip of the frame so it doesn't show. And you press it down, and then you set your mounted needlework on top of those spacers, your backing, seal up your frame, and then your glass is lifted up off of your cross stitch piece. So these are very simple to use. I just need to get a better tool for cutting it so I'm not just like breaking it jaggedly. <laughs> I'm super professional around here. So Melissa and Stitching Diva, both on YouTube, they asked me what are the things that I was putting on the back of my mom's frame? And hey, look, I have that right in front of me. So what are these? These are called turn buttons. Um, for framing, you can use glazer points, which go into the wood to secure um, the backing down. But this backing was pretty flush with the back of the frame. So if you have a piece um, like a not very thick frame and your mounted piece and your spacers and everything stick up past the depth of your frame like this, then you can install with just a little screwdriver, these little turn buttons, and then you turn them. <laughs> Oops. I'm doing this weirdly. Um, over the back and they hold everything in place. Just like a traditional picture frame, these are just called turn buttons. And I got them in the Hobby Lobby um, picture frame section where they have all the like little hanging hardware, picture frame wire. Um, they have 
turn buttons and glazer points. So you can get them there. Okay, Brolin Mills on Instagram asked me, what is a good beginner sewing machine and can I recommend an affordable one? So I don't have an exact machine to recommend, but what I can say based on my experience, I, um, when I was a little kid, was gifted a faff, like a 1970 something all metal faff that had like six stitches. And that is what I used until I was about 22, 23. So all through middle school, high school, um, that was my sewing machine and I loved it. And in, in really most of college, I think that's what I used. And it was great. Um, it was really solid, well built, but it only had like six stitches. It had none of the fancy features. <laughs> and um, yeah, I wanted a new machine at that point. I was working at Hancock Fabrics. I got a discount on sewing machines. And so then I upgraded to about a four to $500 Singer machine that had, you know, hundred and something stitches, had um, the more automatic like back stitch, needle threader, uh, just some more features, right? And I love that machine. And I used that up until about three or four years ago when I um, upgraded again and got my Juki HZL DX7. Um, it's about a thousand, eleven hundred dollar sewing machine. So not the super high end like Bernina's, but not cheap. Um, and it's fantastic. It's so solid, well built. It's super fast. Um, it has the, of course, like the automatic needle up, needle down, um, the needle threader, the, the thread cutter. Uh, it's just great. It's a great machine. So what I'm going to say about a beginner machine is that don't spend under $200. <laughs> I hope that's not controversial. Um, unless, unless you're getting it secondhand and it's like a good machine you're getting like off Craigslist or from a friend or something. But if you're buying a machine new, don't go buy the $100 machine at Walmart. I think those are pretty crappy. I we used to sell stuff like that at Hancock's when I was in college and people were constantly bringing them in for service or how do I do this? Like this doesn't seem to be working and they're just really finicky and they're not the best quality. They're not fast. They don't sew through thick layers of fabric. Um, I don't know. I just say, I just don't recommend the super, super cheap machines. I don't think they're that useful. I would say what you want to look for um, on a sewing machine, like a basic sewing machine is straight stitch with the ability to change your stitch length from very small almost oh well to zero you want to go to you want to, your stitch your straight stitch to be able to go from zero to like 5.0 millimeters um you want to be able to sew tiny closed stitches and you want to be able to do basting stitches so make sure the machine has a straight stitch with adjustable stitch length you also want to make sure the machine has zigzag um, your traditional zigzag with adjustable width and depth and um, the three point zigzag, which works really great for stretchy fabric. Um, make sure the machine has zigzag and make sure again, stitch length and stitch width are, you know, customizable by you as the user. Those are my tips there. Um, a needle threader, an automatic needle threader is also super handy, but it's not absolutely required, but it's really nice if your machine has a little pull down needle threader. Um, the other thing I would say is make sure you have a needle up, needle down button. I find that invaluable. And what else? I don't know. I, I have, you know, a hundred something stitches on this Juki. I use the straight stitch and the zigzag. That's what I use. Um, if you want to do any quilting on it, like actual like free motion quilting, make sure the machine, um, you're able to drop the feed dogs. Um, and, set, and set your stitch length to zero. Um, yeah, other than that, I would just recommend, I love and have had great experience with my Juki machine and I was on Amazon last night and they do have a couple models around $200 that have really good reviews and look great. So if you're looking for a beginner machine, um, I would get on Amazon, set your price range and then look at all the reviews in your price range and pick one out based on that. Okay, BS. MK27 on Instagram asked me, how do I stitch in hand? Do I use a sewing method? Yes. And I took a little video, a close up video of me stitching in hand, which was so awkward as like the tripod was between my legs and I was kind of 
staring at my phone screen to watch myself stitch. So apologies if my movements are weird and herky-jerky at some points. <laughs> it was not my usual stitching setup. But yes, I stitch in hand and I do use a sewing method and I sew my stitches from right to left. So I come up out of, always out of the bottom left of the stitch. Um, I come up out of the bottom left and I scoop across the top from right to left. And then I scoop from the bottom right to wherever my next bottom left is. So I show you in this little video of me stitching going from right to left and then going up and down and then diagonal. Um, so you can get an idea of how I stitch and why I like to stitch from right to left and up and down. <laughs> Oh my goodness, are you all still with me? <laughs> I've been talking for a long time. Okay, so the last two questions um, came from Kathy and Serana Stitches, and they were asking me to explain all the different tools I use for finishing. So what I've done for that, I did another sit down and kind of finish with me video. I've done one for framing that'll be linked below. This one is gonna be for ornament finishing. And so I'll post that later this week. And in it, I'll show you and talk about all the tools I use, which again, are a lot of quilting tools because that's what I have on hand. So I'll tell you like what I'm using um, as I finish. And so those details will be in that video posted uh, later this week. So if you wanna see more in depth in real time of how I finish cross stitch, keep an eye out for that. Oh my gosh, okay. So should we finally talk about stitching? I, do I need to split this video up? I hope not. Whew, Cause I did do some stitching and I did do some finishing. So I have some things to show you guys. Okay, first up this week are some FFOs. Look how cute. <laughs> and this is what I used for my uh, ornament finishing video for later this week. So you'll see how I finish these cute little guys. Um, so these are both from the Christmas ABC Prairie Schooler pattern. And I did, um, I followed Vanna's uh, gift tag ornament mounting tutorial. And so these are just on mat board with a little bit of batting. Um, I used some cute Christmas fabric to cover the gift tag. I used a little grommet setter to create the little hole and some little red and white baker swine to yeah, finish off the ornament. So it can be tied on to a gift and that can also be hung in the tree as an ornament. So these were stitched by my mom. I'll show you Sophia Snowman. Um, yeah, so these will go back to my mom and she will get to put these on the grandkids' uh, Christmas gifts this year. And then my sisters will get to hang these on their Christmas tree. How cute! So um, as she finishes more of these, I will get the rest of them finished up in the same way. I think they're so cute. Okay, I also have a finished cross stitch piece that I have not FFO'd yet. I was hoping to get to it this week, but I just didn't have time. And here it is. Oh, I love it. I guess I could show you the pattern. This is Hands On Design Mary Chockful. And it just turned out so cute. I stitched it exactly as called for. And well, I'm sorry, I did leave off the uh, bottom vine of little holly and berries that were at the bottom of the mason jar. Um, just to make it fit my finished board a little bit better, um, but I haven't actually finished it yet. So hopefully, maybe this week or next, I'll get to that. Yeah. Oh my God. This is so cute, guys. If you haven't stitched this, go get this one. I can't wait to finish this. Ugh. So that's Mary Chockful. Okay. I finished two other Christmas things this week as well, but they aren't FFO'd yet. Ah! <laughs> I made some Christmas quilts. Oh my gosh. These are 
so cute. They turned out so well. Um, I just used a layer cake um, from this Riley Blake print. I think it's called Way Up North. Uh, it's adorable. Just, yeah. Oh my gosh, these prints. Look at this little guy. Little Santa in his sleigh. The reindeer. Um, this little like Christmas village scene. Uh, yeah. So I made two of these almost the exact same except for my nieces. They got the pink background border and for my nephews they got the kind of white and gray background border. Oh. But they both got this amazing super soft kind of I don't know foresty green um, minky backing. I have never quilted with it before but oh my gosh, look how cool it looks. You can see my little wavy quilting pattern I used. It is so soft. Oh, I love it. Um, the only reason these aren't completely fully finished is I thought I had enough, but I didn't. I want a candy cane stripe border on both of them. So I ended up having to order some more fabric. So these will get bound and finished up and washed, I don't know, over the next couple of weeks. Yay, Christmas quilts. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about Whips Baby. Um, the stocking. <laughs> oh, I wanted to be done with all the X's. I'm not. I'm getting so close, but Ooh, let me back up. There is where I'm at. Still just got this last little, oh, this last little section. Um, I worked a lot more. I finished all the backstitching of the train. Um, I backstitched as much as Santa as I could, I think. And really all that's left is the rest of this chair quilt. And there's like a little stack of these blocks um, right over here. So I am so close. I'm gonna finish stitching it this week. Honestly, this next, this upcoming week, this is all I can work on until it's done. <laughs> That's, I'm just going to make it a rule for myself. Like, I want to get this done. I want to get this finished. So this is what I got to work on until I get it done. And then I can work on my other fun stuff. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I'm stitching this on the called 425 Count Mushroom Legata, three over two with DMC. Okay, next up, I had a new start that I didn't make a ton of progress on, but I started it. And it is Souvenirs of the Heart, um, Home for Christmas by Brenda Gervais with my needle and thread. And oh, this one is just so cute. When it came out last year, I wanted to stitch it and I didn't, but I bought it and now I'm stitching it. <laughs> um, I didn't want to do the over one on 28 count. Um, I just knew I wouldn't really enjoy that. I don't know. Maybe eventually I'll try over one again as like a whole project, but mm, I don't know. Um, so here's my little start. I'm stitching this on 40 count vintage light exemplar from Lakeside Linens. And I think it's going to be a really cute little small pillow finish um, for my pillow bowl <laughs> eventually when it's done. Um, there's a little bit more down here. So it's, you know, it's, it's going to be a pretty good size on 40 count. Um, probably a little bit bigger than an ornament. I like my ornaments a little bit small. Um, so I'll probably do this as a pillow finish and I love it. And I'm using all the called for colors because I had them all on hand. Maybe I think I might have changed the white, but other than that, I have all the called for colors. Okay, the next thing I worked on this week was Christmas Garden by Blackbird Designs. Love, 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 love stitching on this. Um, this is in the Home for the Holidays book. And here is my progress. Oh, I love it. Um, yeah, I've gotten, I think the edge of the border is coming to about right here. So I'm almost across the top with the border. And I was just working on that big center motif. And I added my mom's initials up top. Uh, yeah, I just love this. I guess I should have ironed this because it's all, there's a big fold in the middle of it. Um, but yeah, 
I love the colors I'm using. I have them posted on my Instagram page if you want to see my conversion. But um, yeah, I'm stitching this one as a stitch along. Uh, it's hashtag September Christmas Garden. And um, Celeste and I, Celeste Creates, Celeste and I are doing this together um, along with a bunch of you guys. I showed, I think a couple videos ago, all the other people who are stitching along with us. So I love seeing everyone's progress. And I'm gonna love stitching on this um, as we get into Christmas season. Love it. This is on 36 Count Sand by Pictureless Plus. And the 36 Count Pictureless Plus slid-ins are just like some of my absolute favorites to stitch on. They're just beautiful. Okay, and then the last project I worked on, I only worked on last night for like an hour, so I don't even know if this counts as any progress, but I did work on the border and brought it around to the edge. Um, this is my Barbara Anna's Santa's Trips, and I love it. If you wanna see somebody with a lot of progress, go watch. Mama Loves You GB Michelle. She has kept up with this sal and hers is stunning. Like I saw her, I think it was our first or second video where she showed it and I just was like, um, yeah, I need that. <laughs> so yeah, here's my progress. I was hoping to get that first block done so I could have the whole top row done, but now it's stocking time. So this is gonna have to wait, <laughs> but yeah. Oh, I love working on this. And I am doing this on 40 Count Vintage Maple Syrup by Lakeside Linens with my own NPI conversion from the called for DMC, DMC colors. And if you want this NPI conversion, um, just email me. My email address is listed below and I will email you my NPI conversion. Okay, let's talk about mail because I got some great mail this week, guys. <laughs> I'm going to start with what I ordered first. Um, first from my favorite little thread shop, Anita's, <laughs> I got a pack of threads that I need for, um, an upcoming Blackbird chart that I want to get. Very excited about that. So I got some thread. Um, and then from Kitten Stitcher, I got, um, a Prairie Schooler Santa because I haven't stitched one and I've been trying to figure out which one I want to stitch. And I just love these little gingerbread men. So I got that Santa. Um, I also got Cats on Parade. I think I was talking about this last week because I had bought this vintage sugared ginger from Lakeside and I thought it would be perfect with this chart. And yeah, how great is that going to be? So it's black and Cats on Parade. I, I think I probably want to do um, the framed piece, but I'm not sure. I mean, this is going to be something for next year, but yeah, these are definitely staying together because I want to use this fabric on this piece. And then I got a Blackbird book that um, I think it was Kim, Barbara's daughter was talking about. It's called In Friendship's Way. And she had done this little pin cushion, little mosaic pin cushion, and I loved it. And I love this um, box top. So um, Kids and Sister had this, I think it's an older book, um, and grabbed that Blackbird book. And then you're going to think I'm insane. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, Kitten Stitcher, I don't know where these came from or how, but she had a huge selection of birds of a feather charts. Like, huge. And I went insane and bought all of them <laughs> that I liked. <laughs> I mean, I really bought almost everything she had in stock. Um... They were all still in stock after I bought them, so if you're looking for any particular birds of a feather charts, run over to Kitten Stitcher and see what she still has. Um, <laughs> no bees, no honey, no work, no money. Is that not the truth? Um, <laughs> okay, so somebody mentioned these in my comments the other day about stockings. Birds of a feather has three stockings and they are so cute. Do I have anyone else to stitch stockings for? No. Am I gonna stitch more stockings? Probably not. Why did I buy these? I just had to have them. Look at these stockings. Elves building a snowman. The girl ice skating with a bunny rabbit. 
and Santa Claus and a tiny little tree. Um, yeah. I don't know. I had to have these. Love, love, love these stockings. So those are in my collection. I also got this kind of blue-gray alphabet sampler. I saw this stitched up at the Tinsmith's Wife, and it is beautiful. Um, and then I got some Halloween ones, and oh my gosh, Rob loves these. <laughs> he was laughing at these when I was showing him. Um, look at these pumpkin-headed people with, yeah, the crazy black cat and the snake in a cage or lizard. I don't even know what that is. Love this. Um, oh my gosh, this one is for sure getting stitched for next year. Uh, beware of cat. We have a black cat, Diego. Beware of Diego. <laughs> That's getting stitched. Um, oh, and I love this one too. This one's called Lost Spirits. With the big pumpkin headed guy at the bottom. It's kind of hard to read. It says, Lost Spirits do not embody me on this night of All Hallows Eve. This is from 2001. Love it. Okay, so that was my haul. <laughs> um, I'm gonna show you some happy mail I got and I can't even show it to you all because one, I just got it yesterday. Like last night I checked the mail at like 10 p.m. and there were two huge um, priority flat rate boxes in my mailbox. And I was like, what is this? I had forgotten that two people had emailed me a few weeks ago and been like, oh, I have some old charts. I have some duplicates. I have some stuff, you know, can I send it to you? And I was like, okay, sure, yeah, let me know. Um, and both showed up last night and oh my God, it was Christmas. It was Christmas in my house. I was just sitting at the dining room table, pulling things out going, oh, ooh, oh my God, oh, I wanna stitch this. And Rob was sitting in his office, which is right across from the dining room, just being like, what are you doing in there? And I was like, I'm just so excited. There is so much good stuff. Angie and Paula, thank you. I know I emailed you guys last night. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my gosh, both of you are so great. So let me show you a couple of things. I just pulled a couple off the top um, to show you. Um, one, uh, this I think was in, Angie, I think you sent this to me. Um, but it's a Souvenirs from the Heart. It's the uh, patriotic one, what is it? Star Spangled Spectacular. So yes, I'm gonna have to stitch this after I do my little Christmas version. So this can be a summer pillow. Um, Paula sent me so much great quilting stuff. Uh, some, this was, I really like the look of this one, Quilter's World. And then um, this is like, I cannot wait to dig into this. This is I Love Nine Patches, which I do. And this book looks excellent. And then I really love the cover model on this Quilter's World magazine. So, yeah, Paula sent me so many great magazines and patterns and I need to just sit down and flip through them and find my favorites. And she included notes about what her favorites were in the magazine. So thank you so much. I'm gonna dig in later today and look at all these. And then Angie sent me so many great patterns and charts and just some little strawberry kits. Oh my gosh, there was, or Angie, thank you. <laughs> I know I emailed you, but thank you. Oh, it was so much fun. So I brought out some of the blackbirds I saw in there to show you and two of which no, three of which I have almost bought so many different times. Um, this patchwork pumpkin. Uh, I forget who was stitching this recently. Was it Crosshatch Quilts? Christy, did she show it? Oh my God. Yeah. Love this. Love, love, love. Um, waiting for the harvest of Reward of Merit Pincushion. I have had this in, my, in and out of my cart so many times. I love this. I can't wait to stitch that. And then Feast of Friendship. Oh my goodness. So I have been resisting buying this because I was like, oh, it's a big project. I don't need another big project. But everyone on Instagram and YouTube is stitching it right now. And it's so beautiful. Like, look at this big fruit basket. I'm not a huge house stitcher, so this is intimidating to me. But I want to do this basket of fruit. I mean, I want to do the whole chart, but I want to, oh. And then this showed up in my mail and I was like, well, now I have to kit it up. <laughs> I have to start it. Maybe this will be like a Thanksgiving break start. I don't know. <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. Um, she also sent along two copies of this Blackbird design. So that means you guys are going to get a giveaway. Actually, I have two giveaways for you. This is going to be the first giveaway. Um, 
this is Blackbird Designs Give Thanks. Look how stinking cute that is. A little patriotic turkey on a pumpkin. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, so there were two of these in her box. So I'm gonna give away one of these to you guys. Um, if you wanna win, so this one's just actually, I'm just gonna do numbers. You know how like uh, Priscilla and Chelsea do on their videos. So this is just gonna be giveaway number one. So just um, put, number one somewhere in your comment if you want to be entered to win the Blackbird Designs project or chart. Um, this is a lightly used, well, I, I don't know, it looks perfect condition, so it might not even have been used, but it is pristine and great and I will send it to you anywhere in the world. If you want to enter, just use the number one somewhere in your comment and that's how I'll know that you want to be entered to win. And then let me show you giveaway number two. So giveaway number two comes from Sylvia Ward. Um, she reached out and asked if she could send me some of these. And these are her project tracker cards. And these are on cardstock and they have um, a place to record your project name, the designer, the fabric, any notes when you've started and finished. You can even mark down the days on the calendar that you are stitching on this project. And I think these are so great and so clever. The only problem is that I keep track of that stuff on an Excel spreadsheet. I am not good about keeping up with physical notes. I have tried. I've tried a journal. Um, I'm just not good at the physical project card uh, organization. I use my computer in an Excel spreadsheet. But if you would love to win copies of, um, I think there are 20, maybe 10, of these project cards, um, I will send this pack to you. Uh, if you are interested in these, you can get them on Sylvia's Etsy uh, site. I think it's S Ward Designs. I'll link it um, in the description box below. But yeah, some really fun little cross stitch or even quilting or whatever you wanted um, project cards. So if you want to be entered to win these, just put number two somewhere in your comment. You could enter for both, one or the other, doesn't matter. Um, and you can be anywhere in the world and I'll mail these to you. As long as the USPS will ship there, I will send them your way. So yeah, those are the giveaways. Okay, I think we've made it to the end. I've been filming for over an hour. This is probably gonna be one of my longest videos. Ah! <laughs> I hope you all made it through. Um, I did wanna give you guys a heads up that I'm gonna be taking next Sunday off, um, the November 1st. So I will be back on November 8th. Um, Sunday, November 8th to show you hopefully a lot of cross stitch and maybe some finished stockings. Ooh, I don't know. Um, so just keep that in mind if you're wondering where I am next Sunday. I will post a uh, ornament finishing video for you guys later on this week. So you won't be without me for too long. But yeah, um, thank you for watching and I will see you guys in two weeks.